Okay. Hello everyone. So good morning. So welcome to the morning session of the workshop. So today's first speaker is uh, Dr. Kyu Sung Hwang from Korea Institute for Advanced Study, and he's going to talk about the topological quantum dimers emerging from G-type spin liquid bilayer. So uh, Dr. Kyu Sung Hwang, you have uh, 45 minutes to the questions. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm Kyu Sung Hwang from Korea Institute for Advanced Study. So as you noticed the uh, from the oh I'm sorry <laughs> so it's fine. Okay. As you notice from the title, uh, this talk is about quantum spin rigging. Uh, specifically, I'm going to talk about uh, an interesting quantum phase transition occurring between two different quantum spin rigging induced by uh, any condensation. Okay. Uh, since uh, this talk is about quantum spin rigging, uh, uh, let, uh, let me start with a uh, brief introduction about uh, quantum spin rigging. So quantum spin rigid is an exotic quantum state of matter uh, characterized by uh, the following properties. Uh, first, a quantum spin rigid does not have any symmetry breaking. Mm -hmm. So basically, uh, we cannot define any local order parameter in this state. And second, uh, quantum spin rigid is a highly quantum entangled state. In other words, uh, quantum spin rigid cannot be represented by a simple uh, product state wave function. Uh, lastly, maybe this is the most interesting property. Uh, quantum spin rigid can support uh, anion quasi particle excitations. So, anions are, are usually particles that are neither bosons nor fermions. So, it is somewhere between uh, fermions and bosons. And this anion, uh, anion is anion quasi particle excitation, is a basically a manifestation of the uh, uh, long range quantum entanglement uh, of quantum spin rigid. So, different quantum spin rigid have has uh, different types of anion quasi particle excitations because of a uh, different pattern of uh, long range entanglement. So, then what is the example? Maybe the simplest and oldest example is the uh, uh, um, resonating balance on spin rigid state, uh, originally proposed by Philip Anderson a uh, very long time ago. So, basically, uh, RBB state is a uh, uh, quantum superposition of all possible. Um, spin singlet dimer configurations. So this video shows the uh, RBB state on the two-dimensional Kagome lattice. So this type of uh, spin rigid has been a, a subject of intensive studies uh, in quantum magnetism. Uh, for instance, uh, this RBB spin rigid state has been studied in the uh, uh, Kagome lattice Eisenberg model and also the candidate material Herbert Smith state. Nowadays, uh, this RBB spin rigid state it's being uh, studied uh, in, uh, in various quantum simulators, uh, including uh, this uh, Rydberg atom arrays. The second example is the uh, type spin rigid. So I, I guess uh, the, most of the people who have heard of uh, this name, type spin rigid. So type spin rigid is basically uh, the ground state, uh, ground state of the, uh, the well-known type honeycomb model. So this model is basically exactly so, and the ground state has a quantum spin rigid phase, uh, which we call uh, Kitab spin rigid. A remarkable property of the uh, Kitab spin rigid is the uh, emergence of Majora fermion as a quasi particle excitation. So the possibility of the Kitab spin rigid and also the Majora fermion has been uh, intensively studied recently uh, in the candidate material using trichloride. Uh, in fact, uh, the next speaker, Professor Yongjun Kim, is a pioneer of the uh, ketonic physics uh, in this uh, lucidium trichloride. I'm sure he's going to tell us the recent uh, experiment situation uh, of this, uh, this uh, nice uh, and interesting material. Uh, in my talk, I will focus on a rather theoretical problem uh, closely related with this type spin liquid and also this RBB state. So then, uh, what is the problem that I'm interested in? So let's suppose uh, we have a system that has uh, uh, different quantum spin rigid phases uh, depending on the parameter reasons. So suppose we have, we, 
suppose uh, we are controlling some parameter uh, of the system, and the system has a quantum spin liquid A phase in some parameter region. And as we change the parameter, the system takes different quantum spin liquid phase in some other pa uh, parameter region. And these two quantum spin liquids are separated by a single uh, quantum phase transition. So this type of quantum phase transition is quite interesting and non-trivial because we cannot define any local order parameter because both sides of the transitions does not break any uh, symmetry of the system. So this is way beyond uh, the, the conventional landau ginzburg wilson paradigm. So basically we don't, uh, we don't have a good understanding about this kind of transition. So I have been uh, <clears throat> trying to understand this type of uh, quantum phase transition. Uh, unfortunately, uh, I found some concrete rabbit model recently, and I found uh, some intuitive picture about uh, some uh, about uh, this kind of uh, transition. So that is what I'm going to talk today, and I will introduce the model in the next slide. So this is the model that I found recently. So this is a basic spin model defined on a honeycomb radius bilayer with AA stacking. So simply speaking, this model is a uh, two copies of a uh, Kitai honeycomb model, but there is a, a interlayer interaction uh, in this form. There are four spin operators. Uh, I guess uh, most of the audience is not familiar with the uh, Kitai physics. So before we discuss details about about this model, uh, let me briefly uh, review some essential uh, properties of the Kitai Panico model and Kitai spin model. So Kitai Kitai uh, honeycomb model is basically a spin model defined on two-dimensional honeycomb lattice. So basically, at each side we have a quantum spin half, and these spins are coupled by uh, bone-dependent easing interactions. So notice that there are three different bone directions of the honeycomb lattice. So red bone, uh, green bone, and um, blue bone, we have three different uh, bone directions. So on red bone, spin X components are coupled by this aging interaction. On green bone, spin Y components are coupled by this aging interaction. On the uh, blue bone, we have a aging interaction of this spin G components right there. Uh, interestingly, uh, seemingly uh, a little bit complicated model, this model can be exactly solved. How? By uh, employing this uh, minor fermion representation for spin half operators. So basically we employ four different minor fermion operators. Uh, uh, yeah, BX, BY, BG, and C. These are my, uh, these are uh, four different minor operators. So if we, we can, we can rewrite the spin half operator uh, by using these four different minor operators. So you can, it is, it is fun, quite straightforward to check uh, this representation satisfy the, uh, you know, SU2 re-algebra, SU2 spin, spin algebra. So with this uh, minor representation for spin operators, uh, the original Hamiltonian becomes this uh, effective minor Hamiltonian. So this minor Hamiltonian is quite simple because uh, the CMR fermion is coupled to this uh, G2 gauge field. So this G2 gauge field, UIJ, is provided by this um, B Myra fermion pair at each nearest neighbor bone. So this G2 gauge field is, is basically a classical variable because it commutes <coughs> with the rest of the Hamiltonian. Uh, so this is a classical variable taking a uh, plus one or minus one. So it's quite easy now. Why? We have classical variable here. Only this effective minor Hamiltonian is quadratic in terms of C minor fermion. So simply speaking, uh, we have a, a quadratic, quadratic Hamiltonian of uh, this C minor fermions coupled to, coupled to this uh, static uh, G2 gauge field. So that's why we can solve this model exactly. We just diagonalize the uh, quadratic Hamiltonian. And the ground state has a quantum spin liquid base. We call it a uh, type spin liquid. And in this Kitab spin liquid phase, we have two different types of X station. One is a fermion X station derived from this C minor fermion, 
And the other extension is a G2 flux extension uh, associated with this G2 gauge field. This uh, G2 flux extension has a finite energy gap, but uh, the fermion extension is gameless when there is a time reversal symmetry. And this is the shape of the fermion extension spectrum. So you see there is no gap in the presence of time reversal symmetry, but if we break the time reversal by applying magnetic field like this, then we open a finite gap in the fermion spectrum. And the, uh, the fermion excitation spectrum becomes topologically non-trivial, uh, characterized by this, uh, uh, this Mara Chan number, uh, taking plus one or minus one, depending on the uh, magnetic field direction, this uh, non-zero Chern number has a, a non-trivial consequences in energy physics and also thermal transport. So if you put the system in a, uh, in a geometry with a physical edge, then the system shows a gameless chiral minor edge mode like this. And this chiral minor edge mode gives rise to uh, the well-known half quantized thermal pole effect. So this is the uh, overview of the uh, 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 Kitai and Honeycomb model. Oh, somehow there is no time in this page. So I don't understand. <laughs> Anyways, uh, this was the uh, rapid review of the uh, Kitai and Honeycomb model and uh, Kitai spin wicket. So let's go back to the uh, uh, to the bilayer model that I found recently. So now remember this model consists of uh, two copies of uh, Kitai model here and there. And they are coupled by this interlayer interaction. So this interlayer interaction is basically, you know, so in this model, so each bone of the upper layer is coupled by uh, the, the adjacent, adjacent bone on the lower layer. And the interaction form is just a product of the uh, archetype boundary interaction. So this, initially, this bone is coupled by this sigma x, sigma x interaction. And this one uh, is coupled by tau x, tau x interaction. So these bonds are coupled. So we, we put, we, we put interlayer interaction these, between these two bonds uh, in this fashion, just a you know, simple product of the uh, type uh, bond Hamilton. Yes. Could you comment this a little more? But mm -hmm. I, I, what I understand is this so first interaction state inside the layers are just an isotropic exchange, yes? Um, in this, in some Heisenberg model language, what is this <laughs> interleg carbon? So you mean so maybe there's some other model? Your Hobart model. How can we derive this interleg oh, interaction? Is that your question? Uh, actually, I don't know. I just designed this way because I found uh, this model can be solved in some limit exactly, and also it show very interesting physics. So I it, uh, yeah, I came to you. How to derive this kind of? How to analyze this form? Yeah. Maybe I can tell you later after the talk. Okay. It's not a shift. But it's, it, it's not going to be sure. <laughs> yeah. Anyways, I, if there is some um, you know, some motivation how I consider this type of interaction. So in any case, uh, this model, as I mentioned earlier, has uh, actually this model contains two exactly solvable points. Obviously, one is a uh, p-type limit with no interlayer interaction. That point is exactly solved, right? And in the other limit, with only uh, interlayer interaction with no p-type interaction, that point is also exactly solved. I'll show you later, very soon. So around the two uh, exactly solvable point, I perform some um, you know perturbation theory and uh, construct some effective. Uh, effective theories uh, to understand the phases of this model. Uh, for over the, over the general, generic uh, parameter reason, I also perform some numerical calculations by using uh, exact diagonalization techniques. Basically, I put the system uh, on a finite size cluster uh, with a 24 and 24 uh, size, and I do uh, brute force exact diagonalization. So I'm going to uh, show the uh, show my results uh, in the next in the next slides. So this page, this slide summarizes uh, the major results of the uh, of this work. So basically, this is the phase diagram. 
So here I, I, I choose this parameterization uh, for the coupling constant. So I here I'm I'm only changing the theta variable. So at this point, theta equal to zero, this point corresponds to the uh, k only interaction point. And the other limit, k, theta equal to pi over two, that is uh inter interlayer interaction only model. So those two points are exactly so. And we know uh, this point is basically at this point, the system has uh, just a uh, you know key type spin naked bilayer bilayer states with with no uh, interlayer uh, correlation or interlayer uh, entanglement. It is quite uh, I mean it is uh, even we increase the interlayer coupling, uh, the phase will we we won't be changed. So basically, we we'll, we we still have uh, this. Uh, um, Kitaev spin liquid uh, by layer state uh, with weak uh, correlation between the layer. So this part is kind of expected, right? Oh, can you explain why you got the uh, t second derivative of uh, that is the uh, exact derivation, the regions of exact derivation. So when so when we do exact derivation, uh, in order to um, you know you, you know with in order to determine the phase boundary, we consider that quantity. If they, if we see some peak structure, then that means uh, there is a phase transition there. Yeah. So basically, there is a single phase transition in this parameter space. So here we understand this is a type spin naked bilayer state. Then the question is, what is the the other phase? Yes. Uh, have you checked that this peak and this uh, second derivative uh, becomes uh, narrower? when you increase the lattice size. I really hope so, but- uh, Because this will be a signal of- Yeah, yeah. yeah. The pearl. Yes, but uh, you know, we have 48 size in total in my cluster. That is almost the maximum system size that we can do in each application. And practically, I cannot increase the system size anymore. Yes? So if you have long term then why do you expect that to be? Um, sorry, I, because it's not you play in the beginning, you said that yeah. if you have two uh, quantum spin you don't mm -hmm. have a uh, Landau tip, mm -hmm. not a parameter. And this is something like you're plugging the susceptibility. Yeah. Susceptibility, yeah, yeah. And then from Landau theory, we expect that you know, as you increase system size, etc., it will be more sharp and mm -hmm. so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. Why would I expect the same behavior here with the spin I mean, that applies to, I mean, that, that is quite generic. I mean, not limited to Landau theory. So, yeah. Okay, but can, there, the, can there be systems where you do not see this behavior, but still there yeah, will be some phase transitions like this? Still, you could face transition mm -hmm. that would show in the anneality, like you know, whatever the signatures of the annealities. Mm -hmm. You will see, you will see, you will see later. Yeah, yeah there's just a couple of points. Okay. I, I think, you know, in some sense, if you can show that you have clearly different, qualitative different two topological phases in the chain, mm -hmm. maybe the real question is, you know, not that this gives us some kind of transition, but mm -hmm. That you have continuous transition instead of a first first order transition, uh -huh. and I, I guess in that sense, that's what you're showing us is like persuasive, not that will theory or not, because mm -hmm. you know if this is too much first order, I, I guess you should. This is not first order transition. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, it's, it's like you should see something really discontinuous. Mm -hmm. But I mean, my my actually second point is I, I what I really want to ask at this point is like. I mean, what you've showed, showed for the quantum diamond world really looks like Kitab Torah code. And yeah, essentially, it's equal. Yeah, yeah, so I, I just want to know if you have exact mapping. I mean, I understand that all the terms and all the OG terms are, can be, can be commentating, but I just don't, I, I'm not getting a picture of what to give us E and what to give us N. E particles and N yeah. particles. Yeah, that's a can good question, actually. Can, can you do the mapping? Okay, uh, so is there uh, any simple mapping or should we should we discuss it later? Okay. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I just want to make sure well, we are on the same page. I mean we 
all the audience. So uh, you are you. Will you demonstrate why this AZ dial? Yeah, yeah. I'll show you. I'll show you. Uh, that's one one of the major points, many major reasons of this one. Yeah. So okay. So anyways, I uh, on this side. Uh, we found that the system has an RBB stick, RBB spin request stick. This is not obvious, but I will show you very soon. So near these uh, two exactly level points, I performed my mean field theory for this point, and I found that uh, the two layers have opposite chunk number, plus one and minus one. On the other limit, uh, around this point, uh, I did some perturbation, degenerate perturbation theory, and I, I succeeded to uh, derive some effective, effective model, which is basically quantum diamond model on dual carbon lattice. And this model is ejected solvable actually. And the ground state is the RBB state. So that's, I, that's how I figured out the system has RBB uh, spin liquid state uh, on this side. All right, then. Uh, Okay, so the remaining part of this talk, uh, I'll be focusing on these uh, two things. First, uh, how RBB state arises near this point, and also what is the nature of this, this transition? So first, let me consider the RBB state. Uh, in order to uh, perform uh, DJ perturbation theory near that uh, G, G limit, G only point, G only interaction point, so let's first consider a uh, G only model. So here, this H dot H zero is basically interlayer interaction, only interlayer interaction, no K-type interaction. So here, the, the interlayer interaction uh, is written in terms of this phi variable. Phi is basically composite spin. I mean, uh, basically a, a simple product of this sigma and tau. So remember, we had uh, two sigma variables and two tau variables. I just uh, you know, I just paired up in this fashion. Then the Hamiltonian becomes uh, in this uh, bilinear form. Very interestingly, these five variables are all commute with each other, meaning we can treat, treat them as a classical variable, taking plus one or minus one. And, but, but there is a, a one a constraint on this phi variable. The, the, the product of this uh, phi x, phi y, phi g must be minus one. This is coming from uh, this constraint. You know, we know the product of uh, these three Pauli matrices must be imagine number i, right? But we have a uh, this, and also we have another uh, tau, three tau operators in this product. So that's why uh, this product should be must be this minus. So that means uh, this constra constraint gives the uh, four states, not eight states, as I shown here. So these four states are allowed by this constraint. That is consistent, right? So we have spin, two spin half uh, degrees of freedom at each side, and they can have only four states. For instance, we can have a uh, spin singlet or spin triplet in terms of this sigma and tau basis. Uh, very interestingly, uh, this Singlet and triplet states are basically the eigenstate of this uh, phi variable. So spin singlet, uh, it has a uh, minus one for each component of this phi spin. For this tau x, it has a uh, minus one for phi x, uh, a plus one for the other components. Uh, similarly for uh, uh, other states. So anyhow, uh, we have uh, these four states, four local states, and it is quite straightforward to find the uh, ground states. Actually, there is an extensive degeneracy in the ground state manifold, and each ground state satisfies this local constraint. So basically, we just minimize this boom interaction. Remember this local constraint. This is important for our uh, discussion. OK, now we have a ground state. We now figure out the ground state manifold of this uh, unperturbed Hamiltonian. Then the next question is what is the effect of the archetype interaction uh, on this ground state manifold? So to understand that, uh, we can do a uh, you know, digital perturbation theory. Uh, okay. Sorry, this 
this slide is not so helpful. <laughs> Anyways, uh, we can do uh, digital polarization theory and the resulting effect of how Tonian takes this form. So basically, uh, by doing sixth order polarization theory, we obtain this effective Hamiltonian, uh, consisting of uh, this uh, G2 flux operator. Actually, I didn't mention this G2 flux operator. Maybe. So G2. So, so this is my honeycomb radius. And this is my X bone, Y bone, and G bone. And there are heat time interaction at each bone, right? Sigma XX. So sigma XX. And here, sigma ZZ. And here, sigma Y, sigma Y. So WP operator is defined at local half seven. Uh, this is uh, basically a product of this, all these uh, Kitai bond interactions. Something like this. Um, like this. I know it's uh, kind of abstract notation, but essentially, uh, this is what it is. <laughs> Anyways, uh, so this is the effective Hamiltonian, and this Hamiltonian can be solved exactly. The ground state is just uh, just given by this. Yes. So this this uh, WP mm -hmm. uh, is it defined for one layer or one layer or oh, we uh so. We can we can define it both layers, but we only consider uh WP on a upper layer. Yeah, because uh so okay, we can do the same thing for lower layer. Let me call it uh GP. This case is a uh, how I how day and blah blah blah. But for the ground state manifold, we can. Uh, we can check. So basically, these two are uh, same, same. I see. Yeah, in the ground state manifold because of the uh, local constraint, of the ground state manifold. <laughs> so that's why we don't have to consider uh, this GPO for it. Okay. So, uh, so this is the uh, ground state wave function of the Ibrahim Hamiltonian. So basically, we chose we choose one. I mean, some arbitrary state in the from the uh, unperturbed ground state manifold. And then we take this uh, projection operator. What this uh, projection operator does is, uh, you know, uh, it makes sure the the resulting state has the uh, uh, the has the has uh, plus one for this uh, uh, WP operator, plus one eigenvalue for the uh, WP operator. Then that is the uh, the, the minimum energy state, right? This diagonal is a double diagonal. Timer, yeah, maybe which so. timer are you talking about now? Yeah, the, the, if the timer means the composite heterogeneous timer. So I didn't mention timer yet, actually. But the, you know, the, you know, the, the quantum timer is the quantum. Yeah, I'm going to talk about that. Yeah, the DP is the time. Yeah, yeah. The, the, the timer reads on a uh, dual carbon radius, which I haven't <laughs> introduced yet. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So so okay, so this is the ground state, and you can see this is a highly quantum entangled state state because uh, this projection operator will generate many many different uh, you know components, and they are all mixed in, in this ground state. So in this sense, it's a highly quantum entangled state. Okay, then how do we see uh, this is a RBB state? Uh, in order to see that, we should take a dual mapping to dual carbon lattice. So the dual, oh, sorry. What am I doing now? <laughs> okay. So this is the mapping. So basically, we originally we had this honeycomb radius, and we collect midpoints of all the bones, and then we connect them. Then we obtain this carbon radius. Interestingly, we had a three different bone direction on the honeycomb radius. Corresponding to these three directions, we can define 
uh, three, three different directions on the Kagome radius as well. So this x direction, x bone direction, is perpendicular to the uh, x direction of the honeycomb lattice. Similarly for uh, other uh, bone directions on the honeycomb uh, lattice. So this is the dual mapping for the lattice. Then how about the states? How do we uh, how do we take a mapping uh, of the uh, of these uh, four states? So basically, we follow this rule. So here I'm uh, considering the bilayer system as a single layer with four local states. So at each side, we have spin singlet and spin triplet. And we are taking um, dual mapping to Pagome Radis. And each side is replaced by a local triangle uh, on this uh, carbon radius. Right. And we had a x, y, g direction. Here we have a, a it's an x direction, y direction, and z direction. So let's say we have a spin single state. Here, then the spin single state is uh, is mapped into empty triangle. We don't have any dimer on this corresponding local triangle. If we have a TX state at this point, then uh, in the corresponding triangle, we have a uh, one dimer on X bone. So this is the X bone on the carbon uh, radius. So we have uh, this dimer state corresponding to this one. So similarly, we can do the same thing. We can repeat the same thing. So for this uh, TY state, uh, we have a, uh, uh, yes, this time of state. This is my uh, dual mapping between the honeycomb radius and the carbon uh, radius. So then what we see about this ground state manifold is uh, so ground state manifold is basically a uh, dimer configuration. So that into a dimer configuration on the uh, dual carbon radius, satisfying the so-called uh, hardcore dimer constraint, meaning that each side of the carbon radius is occupied by only single dimer. So every side is occupied by a single dimer. That's strictly speaking, not a part of this state, it's a quantum dimer state, right? So these states are not a quantum dimer. Right. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> but if you consider non also ability, uh, then it's, it's quite difficult to, you know, <laughs> construct. It. You said it's going to be easier. <laughs> <laughs> so we just, uh, we just take a simple way. Here, at, uh, at this point, uh, we don't consider that that issue. We just assume all the dimer states are also going to each other. Okay, so the ground state manifold is basically dimer Hilbert space. And what this uh, flux operator does is uh, it generates dimer motion or dimer resonance in this fashion. For instance, if we have uh, this dimer configuration at this local hexagon, that, then this WP operator moves this dimer along this uh, uh, local hexagon by one lattice, one lattice unit. So that way, uh, this operator generate diamond motion. Similarly to other uh, diamond configuration. So basically, this operator, when this operator act, acting on a uh, a diamond diamond state, it generate all possible uh, diamond configuration satisfying the uh, hardcore diamond construct. And here we, we mix all of them. So that is why this state is, uh, is the uh, RBD state. So does it make sense? <laughs> okay, so. Excuse me. So, I mean, 
can you just write down the this G term in terms of those uh, in the basis you have you have on the board? Mm -hmm. G a single, single, single triplet basis, can, can you write down the how, how this G and original board and spin interaction looks in that basis? In this basis? Yes. Yeah, I can write it. I have an expression. Yes. Okay, so suppose I did that, then what what do you want to see from that? But the each is the two sides you, you think about the I layer and total you think about the each spin is not spin caps are spin one. How do you pass it? What do you mean? You quite the two two just think of and how. Yes, right. So okay. initially we have a we had a, a bilayer model. Yeah, I know, but yeah. yeah. But you now know, we have your state is uh, not simply think. Yeah, our total state is also sigma and tau is independent of the angle. So I'm, I'm considering those two spin together. Yeah, yeah. yeah. so that's, what, that's why I have these four states spin yeah. singlet, triplet of sigma and tau. Yeah. So those two sides are merged into one single side yeah. uh, with these four states. In this description, yes. so they need that. Uh, uh, yeah. Okay, yeah. so I I, know, uh, I only have a, uh, about eight minutes now. So uh, let me yeah. <laughs> let me wrap up this stuff. We can discuss later. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So this is the one part, and the uh, next part is uh, okay. So we come back to this base diagram. So I I want to talk about the nature of this uh, transition. So what drives this transition? So simply speaking. So remember, we had a, a so on this side, we have a key type spin naked and key type spin naked. They are weakly correlated. And at on each layer, we have a fermion excitation. Do you remember that, right? Yeah, fermion excitation on the upper layer, fermion excitation on the lower layer. So across this transition, what happens is that, so they form, yeah, something like group of pair, and then they get condensed. So the condensation of the fermion pair gives rise to this RBB state. So I confirmed that uh, from eject ionization output. How? Uh, maybe this is the, uh, uh, the, the most important measures. Uh, so to check that scenario, I consider this, this rule operator, this L operator. This is a basically a product of uh, key type one interaction along this half uh, hexagon on the upper layer and the half hexagon on the lower layer. So it given, uh, it given by uh, this expression. So we have a uh, three tau type interaction, three sigma uh, type interaction. It's a gauge invariant? Yeah, gauge invariant. Because it is spin, it is written in terms of spin, so it must be physical and gauge invariant. It's not fermionic. But... Yeah, not hard. Yeah, that's right. Uh, in order to, uh, the meaning of this operator, we should go back to the uh, Myron representation. So in terms of Myron fermion representation, this uh, K-type bond interaction is just a, you know, C Myron on a bilayer. What it means is, uh, so if we add this uh, K-type bond interaction term on some state, then basically we create uh, a pair of uh, complex fermions at both sides, site I and J, or we move one complex fermion from side I to another side J. So that's the effect of this, uh, uh, this type term. Then in this setup, what this L operator, operator does is uh, basically we create two complex fermions on this bone, and then we move one of them along this half hexagon. And also we do the same thing on the bottom layer, right? Does that make sense? It's quite strange, right? <laughs> we do not close, uh, you know, this hexagon on the a, uh, a same layer. We do on different layers because we want to, we want to, we want to, uh, you know, we want to prove uh, the condensation of a fermion pair between the layers. 
So if there is no fermion condensation, so the fermion excitation on the upper layer and fermion excitation on the bottom layer, they are distinct object. They are completely, completely different uh, uh, excitations, right? So they cannot move across the layer. So that's why we see a uh, small value close to zero on this side, because there is no correlation between the layer and the types indicated by layer state, right? But when we enter uh, on in the other phase, I mean, RBB state, then we see significantly large value of this L operator. Why? Because there is a fermion pair condensation happens in this phase. If that fermion condensation happens, then the fermion excitation on the upper layer, fermion excitation on the bottom layer, they are not distinct anymore. They are identical particles now because of the uh, condensation. You know, if there is a, okay, so maybe <laughs> writing some condensation will be helpful. Anyways, uh, I have five minutes. I can, I think I can finish in five minutes. So we have uh, two layers and uh, on this upper layer, we have, uh, fermion extension, and we have uh, another fermion extension on the bottom layer. So if there is a fermion pair condensation, then fermion one is basically identical to fermion two, because if there is a condensate, then we can freely add this particle into the system will freely remove this particle, right? So let's say we do this, then we have fermion, there is two fermions. Actually, there is a fusion rule. This fusion rule <laughs> and the that's been written. So if you have uh, two fermions, that is, it is like a nothing. It's just like a you know vacuum sack. So in the end, we only have this phi two uh, fermions. So in this sense, and this particle, the upper layer fermion and lower layer fermion, they are identical part. So on the action of this L operator, we can move fermion along this closed group hexagon. So initially we, we, we create a pair of fermion and we move one of the fermion along this hexagon. And then in the end, we annihilate them. So we can go back to the uh, uh, ground state. So that's why we can have this large value of this L operator. And this is indicating the fermion pair condensation between the layer. This is the mechanism of the uh, uh, transition between this kitab spin naked bilayer and the uh, uh, RBB state. And there is a very interesting uh, connection between the, uh, you know, this ground state local constraint and uh, the uh, fermion pair condensation. So if we, so remember, you, you, you remember this, uh, this, uh, this constraint for the diamond Hilbert state space, right? If we use this constraint, then we can show that this L operator is identical to uh, you know, this WP operator and also uh, GP operator. They are the same thing. They all are same thing, meaning there is no distinction between the upper layer fermion and lower layer fermion. So, oh, sorry. So, uh, right. So the emergence of the uh, RBB state is basically due to the uh, fermion pair condensation in this type spin bilayer. So this is the summary slide. So in this work, I introduced this, uh, uh, you know, uh, concrete uh, spin model that realizes, um, you know, topological transition between two distinct quantum spin rickets. Actually, uh, in more abstract term, this quantum phase transition is nothing but the uh, uh, transition between easing cross easing bar topological order and g tutorial topological order. And this type of anion condensation transition 
has been classified in previous works. But it was done in uh, topological quantum field theory and modular tensor category. You know, all these things are quite abstract. I really wanted to have a you know concrete understanding about this type of transition. So that's why I was trying to build a concrete model like this. And I finally found one, and this shows uh, this provides some intuitive picture about this type of annual condensation transition. So if you're interested in uh, annual condensation, then you can read this uh, review paper written by Fiona Bonnell. And uh, if you want to know more, more about my work, then you can see uh, that archive footprint. So with that, uh, thank you very much. Right, I think hope so. We may accept probably control of the question from the audience. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Thank you very much for your talk. Actually, I, I have one question. So given the complete quality of distinct distinction between the two extremes you're talking about, I understand that there should be phase transition. Mm -hmm. And from what your show calculation you're showing us, we can be pretty sure that it should not be first order. No first order. But, I mean, what I still don't get is like, can you really just look at your calculation and see where where the this transition point is at? So we can keep down the uh, the transition yeah, point. Yeah, how do we do but that? Yeah, because of the finite size effect, everything uh, there is there's always some finite effect, finite size effect. Okay, so first, in usually in exact diagonalization, we we uh, find the phase transition point by calculating this quantity. This is one part, one way, just one, one simple way to pin down the uh, transition point. So if we see, okay, okay you're still, you're still in the yeah, then this, this should be the uh, transition point. But as I mentioned earlier, we are, uh, our system is in a, a, a finite size cluster, then there is always finite size near the transition point. This, so. <laughs> Yeah. It should, should it? So, I mean, if you go to larger and larger size, it should go like a step. I step. think so. I think so. It should be zero and gradually increase from the transition point. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> In your ED calculation, you also are using the some symmetry, right? Oh, yeah, that's a good question. Actually, uh, so, okay. <laughs> So in this model, so I, I mentioned the, uh, you know, GT blocks operator, WP and GP, right? So these are all commute with the uh, Hamiltonian. So these are all good quantum number. You, I utilize this. You search your all possibilities. Yes. And you check the ground. I, I check the, uh, you know, and, different and factors of GP. Yeah. It does not change. Yeah. Depend on the parameter. Okay. Okay. Some, the, the value of GP is a change. Sometimes the change. But no, no, no. Yeah, ground uh, state already the same in the GP and GP. GP. Yeah, it, uh, the ground state occurs in the zero clock sector. So what's the <laughs> in this parameter space? For hexagons, so isn't it the white flux? Uh, for hexagon, high flux, you mean this, this yeah. quantity? No, what? zero flux. Um, yeah, always zero flux. And the ground uh, state lies in the zero flux sector. What, what about, I mean, so you're, you've been talking about fluxes for hexagons, but what about the vertical plugins? What about the vertical plugins? Yes. We are vertical plugins. Yes. There's, there's some magnetic flux for them. Vertical flux? Oh, what? Oh, 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 oh. Ah, vertical flux. Ah, ah, okay. Oh, actually, that's you're a good point. have a layer about fluxes. Uh -huh. Actually, I haven't thought about that. I'm not sure if I can define. I mean, I, of Maybe course we can define, there, yeah. but I'm not sure if that is a good quantum number or not. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So, so it seems like there's no other parameters for uh, symmetry breaking that environment here. Mm -hmm. So which means this is kind of a type of topological uh, edge transition. Yes. In that case, you can define the topological number so something like that, uh -huh. this is my question, and the second question is the, then if you have a such kind of theoretical transition, then there should be a topological defect, you can define something like that. What kind of topological defect do you expect? 
Doppel which could be now that's an interesting question. So for the first question, so in this case, uh, we can, so you're talking about topology yeah, right. what kind of topology yeah, right. okay, yeah. is fine. So this is, a, in this system, it's, it's not like a topological insulator or topological, uh, you know, same metal, uh, but this one, the, these are called topological ordered phases. So it, meaning that uh, in this system, we have uh, anions. So anion has a uh, fusion rules and braiding statistics that can be topological invariant, something like topological invariant that characterizes each phase, each phase. So this is the uh, anion contents of these two phases, and there are uh, uh, you know well defined fusion rules. So from anion to uh, kinds of integer uh, from anions, for example, oh, the transition from anions to mm -hmm. That's right. Uh, so I definitely there is something, some uh, you know, integer value topological invariance. Uh, but you know, I, I think the, the, the most important thing is a fusion rules and braiding statistics. Okay, you know, the, the, the those are essential essential properties of the anion stations. They define the topological order in each phase. So in this case, it's not simply given by uh, some some integer. Yeah, it's you know much richer structure. And what kinds of topological defect? Topological defect. Yeah, that's a good question. So um, so I know one topological defect in this case. So uh, I'm not sure if you like it or. <laughs> so anyways, this argument state is essentially uh, equivalent to. Toricode is the same, you know, the G2H theory. And we can we, we can make a uh, lattice dislo dislocation, and that lattice dislocation uh, behaves in, in a very non trivial way. Uh, let's say we have a particle E, and then we move, uh, move around the, uh, you know, lattice dislocation. Then particle E changes its anion. Uh, you know, its identity. E particle becomes N particle when it travels around the that lattice dislocation. That's that's one example of lattice, uh, you know, topological defect in this case. Yeah, so we can discuss more later and then you'll get back to the interaction.